If Reality Check Radio enriches your day and life, support us to keep bringing you the content, voices, perspectives, and dose of reality you won't get anywhere else. Visit www.realitycheck.radio forward slash donate. Morris Williamson is a repeat guest on The Crunch, and we've had him on before, of course, and he's agreed to give us regular updates on the goings-on at Auckland Council. He was the Transport Minister for many years, so I'll hit him up about what's going on in Auckland Transport. He joins me on the line now. Welcome back to The Crunch, Morris Williamson. Good to have you. Nice to be with you. I hope you've had a restful holiday period, enjoying the sun. Thank God we got a good summer this time. Yeah, this time last year was uh, pelting down with rain in the most appalling uh, manner. And, of course, uh, the left-wing media, people like Russell Brown and Simon Wilson, were accusing the mayor of being absent. I'm not sure that the mayor, I mean, he would like to think he's got godlike qualities, but I don't think he can stop rain. No, um, there are a few people who have tried along the way and failed. I I do worry about the entire issue of climate change because there are people who say, and Marimba Davidson has said it, if the Greens policy was enacted, we would be able to solve climate change. And what that doesn't take account of is we are 0.17 of a percent of the entire greenhouse gas emissions And so even if New Zealand disappeared into the ocean tomorrow and was gone altogether, it will have no impact, no impact whatsoever on climate change. The big driver of climate change will be both Asia and Latin America. And the huge volumes of what they're contributing to the atmosphere in in a week, in an extra contribution, outweighs everything we've done entirely. So... Yes, we do need to do some things to to sort of mitigate climate change. We should have a little bit better building codes in some of the flood prone areas where we build on some stilts and allow better drainage. I was lucky enough to spend some time in New Orleans after Katrina, and it was interesting to see all along the Mississippi that the houses were on like two meter type poles and you had a concrete base plate underneath that where you could maybe store something or even park your car if it wasn't mm. raining. But you couldn't leave anything in terms of living there. And then when the Mississippi did flood, it never got past the one and a half metre of the poles. So your house was surrounded by water, but it did no damage whatsoever. So I think the way we build needs to change so that we, if we do build in flood-prone areas, uh, we do it sensibly. I think uh, better drainage systems where we can get rid of the excess water, et cetera. But the idea we're going to stop uh, these things happening, uh, and in fact, I'm one of the strongest believers in climate change the world's ever seen. I believe the world's climate has always changed and will continue to always change, and we just need to adapt to live within the parameters for which Mother Nature throws at us. I would have thought um, having a chat with a few Dutch people might it might um, solve a few problems as well. Yeah, they've had to. You see, the, the necessity is the mother of invention, and there are people all around the world who have had to change what they've done in order to cope with I mean, I don't know what percentage of the Netherlands is actually below sea level, but I know a big percentage is, and yet they've managed to cope accordingly and, and, and work. So, you know, you've got two options. You can either solve the climate change issue and stop it happening. Uh, well, good luck with that. Or you can say, well, if we are going to get those big floods from time to time, and we always have done, this mm. idea that floods are only a recent occurrence. There have been really big floods and really hot temperatures South of England was estimated to be in the high 40s around the Battle of Hastings time, 1066. That's a thousand years ago. Uh, They were growing grapes and great vineyards and that in the north of Scotland uh, when Scotland was that warm. So, yeah, look, get ready, get real. There will be climate change. There will be heavy sort of events like rainfalls and storms and so on. And uh, we just have to build and mitigate accordingly and cope with it. And it's not that hard if you plan for it. Yeah, it's always it's always interested me that everyone sort of ignores one of the biggest uh, migration influxes uh, that occurred as a result of what would be called climate change these days, and that was the arrival of Angles and Jutes and Saxons 
from Europe into uh, into Great Britain. Yeah. And they were driven out by floods and, yeah. uh, and rising rivers and, and low-lying uh, areas in Jutland and places like that. That's where they got their names from. So they all migrated, and that was well before 1066 when the Normans rocked yeah. up and gave them a lesson in uh, warfare. Yeah. Well, one of the things, if you go to Hastings, there's a plaque there, I was reading it, and it said one of the things that brought down uh, William the Conqueror's soldiers more rapidly than uh, malnourishment and dysentery, which always used to be the biggest killer of soldiers, uh, or bows and arrows and swords, which was second, th th they were falling in the battlefield from heat exhaustion because wearing a suit of armour in a 48-degree mm. temperature, you literally can only swing a bloody broadsword for a few minutes before you... Four. Yeah, you you put on a wool uh, a wool padded <laughs> gambas on and then put put um, five or six kilos of steel chainmail over the top of that and an iron yeah. helmet. Yeah. You're going to get a bit hot, aren't you? Go into a sauna and try running around for a while. Anyway, so so that's one of the things that Auckland's got to face. We've got to start uh, not not the extreme of let's ban building in any flood prone areas because in that case it's just about we're all flood prone at some point somewhere. What we're going to do is say, what what are the likelihoods of flooding in specific zones and what do we need to change the building code so that buildings can still be built there and used there and for the vast bulk of time uh, successfully used there. But when the one in, you know, whatever, 100 years or whatever occurs, we cope. It copes, it functions, it drains. They don't get the water into the living part of the property and so on. Can be done. It's done elsewhere, as you pointed out, Holland. And I, I was impressed as hell along that Mississippi riverbank of what they'd done after Katrina. A good mate of mine who was born in Fiji like me, his father was the Suva City Council uh, chief engineer. And he was responsible for putting in these uh, massive stormwater drains around Suva. And, and you can still see them today. They're, they're, they're almost like the ones in Singapore. Right. And I, I wonder if. Um, if our civil engineers in Auckland City aren't up with the play that we, that Auckland's actually a subtropical city and perhaps we should have monsoon-style drainage systems. I, I think there's no doubt. And remember, stormwater is not a, a, a water care issue. They're there for clean water and sewerage and, mm. and other Stormwater is more a roading issue when you're building your roading network, putting proper culverts and proper, you know, relief ability. In LA, they've got a thing called the Los Angeles River, mm. uh, which I was amazed because if you go down to it, it's not even mostly what, dry. It's well, it's actually concrete. It's yeah. actually not bloody. It's wide as you can't. It's wide as one of the freeways, and it's just solid concrete in a big U shape. And it's there to get all the water out of LA whenever they get. And they hardly ever get rain. I was there for several years, and I think it rained about four times. But but when it does rain, it pours. In fact, there's a really good Albert Hammond song. Seems it never rains in California, but when it does, it pours. And when you get these torrential rains, they've got the infrastructure to cope with getting it out of the place. Yeah, a lot of Auckland's infrastructure, particularly on the isthmus, is clapped out and, you know, over 100 years old in many places and not designed for all the additional infill housing and the additional roads and everything else that's putting all that stormwater through the system. Yes, it's one of the things councils needing to be aware of all the time. You can't just keep adding uh, a burden to the load and not have some relief mechanism to be able to take it away. And so we have built a lot of houses and we've got a lot of people living in a city, uh, it, it, even though we're spread out across a big piece of land, but we haven't kept the infrastructure up to date. And, and this goes back, you know, decades, or more than decades. It's not just the latest council or the one before. It. Oh, it's 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 an intergenerational. The, you know, the council has been, uh, we could even put it back to, you know, the mid-1980s when Michael Bassett's reforms gave general competence to, to the councils. It's at that point that uh, councils started to account for things like depreciation. Depreciation's there for a reason. It's there to fund further capital upgrades but unfortunately right. various politicians from from both sides of the of the spectrum have raided the de depreciation to spend it on frivolities a absolutely um just going back to bassett's reforms because i was in parliament at the time in 1989 what was hilarious was we were taking i think and i won't get this exactly right but i think there were 34 local bodies in auckland 
So you had a Mount Albert Borough Council and the Mount Eden Borough Council and Only Hunger Borough Council and a Newmarket Borough Council and like as for Howick Borough Council and so on. And some of the quotes, I kept them. The mayor of Newmarket at the time said, if we are forced to join with Auckland City Council, as they were, then this will be the end of Newmarket. It's over. Still there. Well, you look at what's flourishing and booming right now and look at what's dead as a dodo. Downtown Auckland is shocking, just shocking. And Newmarket is literally trying to get a car park, try to get around. It is exploding. So I think he got it wrong. Just my just, just my might, might yeah. be, yeah. Mm. And, I mean, and when people say to me, can you come into the into the city for a meeting? It's uh look, yeah. I've got an appointment to catch cancer, actually. I'd, <laughs> I'd rather do that. The other thing that I found at the time, and I made the comment to Bassett at one point about how uh, I'm surprised that even the roads joined up. And one of his officials pointed out to me, if you took down Dominion Road and down Sandringham Road, a number of the cross streets, like, say, Burnley Terrace, yeah. which, which run between Mount Albert and Mount Eden Borough Council, if you're driving along the straight Burnley Terrace, halfway along, there's a little dog leg, only about five or six metres wide, just does a little S and carries on. And you think, well, what was that for? This is a straight road. And that's because that was where the boundary between Mount Eden and Mount Albert was, and they didn't get the roads to line up. So, uh, I mean, that that's the problem with the history of stuff, and he he was good to get it down to, to seven. I, I still think we've got a long way to go to make the super city work. We, we, we thought there would be some real gains. We thought there'd be some real efficiency gains. We thought we would be getting, you know, one human resource department, not seven, one accounting department, not seven. I don't believe that any of what I argued for as one of the ministers in the government of the time that when Rodney Hyde was putting that legislation through, I don't believe we've seen the real benefits of what could happen and I think that's through poor administration and poor governance. Well, we, we were promised um, with the super city that there was going to be less staff and and uh, economies of scale and every other yeah. wonderful, you know, motherhood and apple pie statement that was, was given to convince us all that it was a good idea. Well, let me give you those numbers. Around the time of the merger, there was around 10,000 full-time equivalent staffs across the seven that all got merged into one. So 10,000, and we were, we were, I actually used it in speeches because we were getting the briefing notes from internal affairs. We we could see that the, the efficiency gains deliver about a 25% reduction. So that would be down to 7,500, you know, quite a big saving of mm. staff by, you know, uh, th that sort of rationalizing of all the service delivery. Uh, the current staff at Auckland Council is about 12,500. So that's a two and it's a twenty five percent increase, and yet we had promised a twenty five percent decrease. So the gains haven't come uh, in real terms. The expenditure is exploding. We've got thirteen billion of debt on the books. I, I always say to an audience, thirteen thousand million. So if you had a big pile of a million dollars and just kept walking down the road, thirteen thousand piles of those million dollar piles so we, we have got to stop spending money we have it's the only reason i actually stood for council i wasn't that fussed about being a councillor and i certainly don't think it's a, a job i want to do for long but i want to try and break the back of that spending monster that just keeps consuming money and spending it and yet if you ask your ordinary ratepayer out there are you getting more service delivery for what you pay for your rates I've not met someone. I've done, done it with audiences. Hands up those who think they're getting a better service, more detail, more product, more whatever. Not, not a hand, nowhere. And I said, but are you paying more rates? Every hand goes up. So the reality of it is that, it, that efficiency gains never happened. The staff reduction and rationalisation never happened. And uh, it's time we try to go back and revisit that whole super city concept. I'm still a fan of it. But I would really like to know there were some really strict criteria about how money was spent and what debt could be accumulated. Yeah, it, is, it seems to be a problem with politicians generally, and you being a, a former or current politician, 
we've been promised these massive projects basically filled with hopium, you know, highly addictive. We're going to get these amazing outcomes. Uh, the Super Cities one, Max Bradford's electricity reforms would be another. Yep. We had the, the Three Waters boondoggle that the Labour Party foisted on all of the councils when they originally said it was going to be a choice and then they forced them and coerced them. Just the other day, uh, Christopher Luxon and Simeon Brown announced that Three Waters is getting axed and they've got some other name for it. It's, you know, I, I don't know who was um, hired to do their slogans. I think it was somebody in the local kindergarten to do it. But, it, it, you know, water reform done right or something gay like that, you know, it, it doesn't make yeah. sense. What's your thoughts on on what was released by Christopher Luxon and Simeon Brown? I'm actually quite keen. I don't think the I don't think the slogan's great. I agree with that, but I think it's quite a good idea because the first question that I always have is: name me a country anywhere where they have fixed their water issue by involving race, mm. putting half of a particular race onto governing bodies and boards. Show me where that's made a difference. And of course, that whole co-governance was what brought down the three waters because. Most people lost focus with what Three Waters was supposed to be about and got really angry about why is a certain group of our citizens getting the right to control and govern a particular vital asset to the way we live and work and operate. Uh, and so Three Waters got brought down by that whole co-governance more than anything else. But I, I do quite like the idea of putting a blowtorch back onto councils in terms of how they actually, and, and you hit it, the, the nail on the head before with regards to depreciation. It's the cheapest way to get through good budgets is just don't fund your depreciation. But the day of reckoning comes, and we have just never funded depreciation on so much of the asset base and asset class that councils across the country have got. So the day of reckoning has to come, and the government mustn't be the banker of last resort, or oh, we'll bail you out. But Local government in particular has got to find more intelligent ways. I don't believe that some of the councils we've got should ever exist as small as they are. Uh, and I think a little bit of, um, you know, emerging of some of those rural and small councils. And you can do that by getting a, a council controlled organisation together and letting them run the water operation. And so I think the government's put the ball back in their court, which is the way to go, and then said, come back with structures and funding and proposals, and only then will we necessarily have to either get into loan guarantee systems or even taxpayers' money. See, Auckland's kind of lucky in that regard. It's already got water care. So it, it seems to be a logical, that's already a council-controlled organisation that could fit into that framework. Other councils obviously don't have that and would need to come up with something similar to that. Well, the other thing that Auckland's got, which I think uh, we should be pleased with, is we've got metering. And when I see big cities around this country that don't have any idea of how much water you use. Or even little ones like Wellington. Little ones like Wellington. <laughs> But I mean, we, we here where I live, we use a lot of water because we've got a swimming pool and it requires a lot of topping up when the sun's beating down and the water's warm and evaporation. We should pay more than someone, uh, the, the lady next door who's a pensioner and doesn't use very much water at all. But the idea of that you can have a city like Wellington and not know what usage is going on. Imagine everything. Imagine your electricity. Imagine if you paid an electricity bill as an average for the suburb rather than what you use. Yeah, the guy with the Tesla down the road is getting subsidised by everybody else. So so I think that uh, the new government has also made it clear. They've said they won't make it mandatory, but I think they've made it pretty clear that one of the solution parts to this getting tidy is to actually know what usage is going on and to actually start making people pay. There's a really other good element to that. It actually makes the council carry a lot of the cost itself for the leakage and the wastage mm. because you put charging on those who are using it through their meters, but 43% of Wellington's water is lost through leakage. Boy, if you knew that you were having to pick up the tab for 43% of that and not the people that you're trying to charge, you'd soon get people out there with a bit of duct tape getting those pipes tied up. Well, that's the thing. You know, There's the old business adage, what gets measured gets done. Correct. And uh, Wellington, yeah. I can remember living in Wellington um, visiting you in Parliament at the time, um, yep. 
you know, in my younger days. And yep. uh, I can remember there was a massive outcry when Wellington Council um, suggested that we're going to have water meters and there were yes. people marching in the street and protesting. Well, they're reaping that uh, benefit right now with the water actually pouring down the gutters on a daily basis. There's another good uh, business adage which says if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. Mm. And if you don't know what it is, you know, if you just don't know what is Mrs. Jones next door using compared to the Williamsons with their swimming pool and teenagers who take 12-hour showers, you go, you know, you should pay for your usage. And it's the same when you're driving on the roads. You pay for your usage through your fuel tax or road user charges. And it's the same for a whole range of uh, things you consume. If you want to fly on an aeroplane to go to, uh, I don't know, to go to Hamilton, it's a lot less than if you're going to London because of the volume of fuel that you're using and so Mm. on. So I don't understand how we can not, I mean, I probably live with very small little communities where you can just average it out and say, oh, you will all. But a city like Wellington, for God's sake, how they've not had metering for so long and the wastage. So we'll, we'll see. But I actually think water care has been well run. I had a lot of respect for some of the directors and managers. Mark Ford did a damn good job of running water care when it was first set up. Uh, and uh, it's a shame that we don't have Mark around because I thought he did a, a hell of a good job. Mm. Talking about road user charges, there's a little bit of a diversion here. I see the uh, people with electric vehicles who have been basically bludging off the rest of road users for quite some time are not looking quite so smug now because the government said, right, we're going to actually start charging for road user charges. And we've got articles and stuff and various other woke womble type um, publications where they're comparing a Tesla with um, you know a Toyota Corolla and saying, well, Toyota Corolla's only got this much road user charges and it's in their petrol whereas a, a Tesla is going to have the same as a, as a two-and-a-half-ton ute, and they're sitting there going, this isn't fair. And it, it seems to have escaped them that a Tesla weighs as much as a ute. Yes. Like well, they're look, enormously look, heavy vehicles, electric vehicles. I think it's a very outdated mode to try and charge for the usage of a piece of tarmac based on fuel being put into a tank of a vehicle. Mm. What you should be paying for is distance travelled and weight. Yeah. And if you've got a heavy vehicle, the, the cost is more than a really feather light vehicle. And if you're doing thousands of kilometres, you should be paying thousands of kilometres use. And if you're only doing 20 or 30 a, a month, like the little lady next door who wants to go down to the supermarket once a week. So I think the idea of an excise tax at the pump, and remember, I was transport minister for a bloody long time. I could see a day coming. I always said this in speeches, when you'll have, hydrogen fuel cells. You'll possibly even have uh, panels on the sort of roof of cars where solar will be efficient enough to keep the batteries running. And you will have just a a myriad of different fuel cell to to run the vehicle. You cannot charge any other way than for like a road user charge. Your weight and the distance that you travel. I've got a diesel car. I have to pay road user charges. Every time I upgrade my char- I've got to pay for so many 10,000 more kilometres. Yeah. My weight of my car is known, and my bill comes back, you know, $800 or whatever it is for 10,000K. Uh, that's what all vehicles. So it should not matter whether you're a hybrid or whether you're electricity or a hydrogen fuel cell mm. or whether you've even got some bloody big rubber bands and the, you wind them up and let your car race down the road. It should be based on distance travelled and weight of vehicle. And the same goes for cycleways. That should be charged as well. Yeah, well. I'm oh, dude, there's, not enough, there's not enough cyclists using them to pay for it. I was going to say, the poor guy that goes down it every day, he'll be paying half a million dollars because uh, I, you, you've got me onto a subject which we probably best not to go to. I'm I just so cross at the way we have taken away lanes of road in order to cope for cycleways. And the best example would be around Lagoon Drive on the Waipuna Lake. Mm -hmm. I argued back with AT when they were proposing to take away one lane either way. It is already absolutely locked, blocked, and stopped around there in the morning and at night. If you do that, you will literally create traffic chaos. And they, I said, so if you want to build a busway, go out onto the lake put a concrete bridge out there and, and put extra lanes, but don't take away. Well, they didn't listen, 
Uh, they told me I was wrong. It wouldn't have any impact. And if any of your listeners are struggling to try and come down the Ellerslie Pamua Highway and get around Lagoon Drive onto the Pakarang Highway at time of the end of workday or early in the morning the other way, it is just hell. It is just locked, blocked, stopped cars, backed up. I was coming down the Ellerslie Pamua Highway the other day, got to the intersection with Lunn Avenue. There's a gas station there, and at Lunn Avenue comes in from your left. I looked at my GPS. And it said 47 minutes to my home here in Pakaranga. Mm, it's ridiculous. But, and, but, bring... but, but you go past the beautiful, big, wide as gold plated cycleway, and Councillor Sharon Stewart and I often travel in the same car. And whoever's the passenger, we make notes about how many cyclists we have ever seen on that cycleway. And on many days, even though it's taking us a long time to crawl along, that road, we don't see one cyclist. Yeah, and yet, it's, it's just ridiculous. Well, it's the priorities that were set by the, the previous Labor government, and I, I I do have some sympathy with AT, and that is if they're going to get their funding for things from the government, they've got to comply with what the government's direction are. That's why I'm really hopeful that when the new Minister of Transport, Simeon Brown, puts out the government policy statement in a few weeks' time, that a whole lot of that ridiculous requirement for speed bumps and for pedestrian crossings costing 500000 and so on, that that'll all just come out. I, I want to just take you back a bit. When I first got to be Minister of Transport, it became quite clear from my briefing notes that you could actually invoke a safety regime to whatever extent you wished. And, and the most extreme would be, uh, and I actually said it in a speech once, I think, to the AA, I could actually reduce our road toll to zero like that. I would make the speed limit 10 kilometres an hour. I would make it only self-laying track vehicles so you wouldn't have wheels and tyres. And there would not be a single human being killed on our roads. The economy would be bankrupt by the end of that week and the World Bank would have to bail us out. But I would be able to go to world forums and say, see, I promised you New Zealand is first in the world to not have anyone die on our roads. That's how ridiculous and extreme could be. So what you have to do with road safety is have safety at reasonable cost. That was the mantra that I drove into people. And Mayor Wayne Brown, I appointed him to be the chairman of the Land Transport Safety Authority while I was minister. And he said, I remember being berated by you for about half an hour in your office the day I started. I want to make sure that it's safety at reasonable cost. People will die on our roads. I think it's tragic and every death is tragic. But if you try to get it to the point where we have zero, like the previous government with their big red zeros, you will literally just spend fortunes of money for no real gain because the road toll didn't actually come down with all they were doing and the inconvenience to road users, the delay in traffic movement and the cost of, I mean, when Genie and Homes or whatever it was came out with a, we can build a, a three bedroom home with a walk-in pantry kitchen and a, and a two car garage for less than Aucklanders building <laughs> a speed bump. You think something's wrong here. So hopefully AT have learnt, although I see the latest announcement, they're going to head with more and more of these stupid things. When the government policy statement comes out, they'll not be able to hide behind that excuse anymore. Well, we have to do it because the central government mm. is giving us that directive. And the ads on the road to zero made me just so angry. Yes, we want the road toll to come down. And one of the things... One it's of our never going to get to zero. It was such a stupid statement. Yeah, it's just never going to get to zero. I mean, I'm just looking at a chart for uh, the road toll fatalities uh, in New Zealand. Yes. And there's this big fuss made about 300 and something, you know, high 300s of the road toll every year at the moment. But people are unaware that in about 1972, we had our highest ever road toll. At 870. 870, something yeah. like that. Yeah. And then between nine between 1972 and about 1987, yeah. it sort of drew, went down a little bit to about 570, but back up to 800 again yeah. uh, in, in 87. But every year since then, it has been a downward slope. Yeah. 
Yep. Because we've had increases in technology. We've had airbags. We've got side intrusion beams. We've got the compulsory um, yep. uh, seat belts. All of these measures have had no impact. Uh, had, you know, there's no roading impact on that at all. And yet we've got AT that's got this directive to try and get to zero by some stupid date that's actually impossible with a growing population. Well, but the councils around the country, I've, I've been in Hamilton a lot recently because my mum was in Waikato Hospital until she died and I've been living in Hamilton. And they've gone in what they call in-lane bus stops. So they've built these special things where the bus just stops and the traffic backs up and there are cars coming around the corner thinking it's a free road to come around the corner on and suddenly, whoa, straight. And you talk to local Hamiltonians and they just say, this is madness. This is absolute madness, and I think there's a by-election going on in Hamilton now for one of the council seats and the previous national MP there, Tim McIndo, standing. He said he's standing on a let's get rid of the in-lane buses and let's get rid of the speed bumps and all the pedestrian crossings with race. And he said the, the support that people are expressing for, thank God, there's some common sense. Now, I don't blame the, the council if the central government say, if you're going to get the funding you want, then this is what you have to do. But the road to zero meant, made no sense whatsoever. Every activity human beings are involved in, every activity, including flying airplanes and whatever, there, there are people who drown in the bath every year. If we want the bath to zero policy, we should be ripping out baths all across the country. There should be a bath police. They go suburb to suburb. Well, we, we, we should just say allow baths, but only if they're got half a centimetre of water yeah, in Yeah, the bath can only be two inches deep and otherwise. And well, you can drown in less than two, two, you can drown in that. So, yep. you know, we've got to be, so you can't drown in it. So let's make the baths, you know, almost like a shower tray. So that, that that's how silly it gets. Look, as I said, every death's a tragedy and so on. But the fact is that transport is the greatest enabler of economic growth. It gets our food to all the distribution centres and we we eat well and live well now compared to previous generations. It allows for us to participate in uh, entertainment and holidays and so on that we never used to be able to. It, it allows for all of what our new society wants. In return for that, there will be tragic, car crashes where people lose their lives. And if you want to say, well, we'll have it a zero, then all you're going to do is make it impossible for people to participate in a modern society. So I'm really pleased that the, the big red zeros that Michael Wood spent 10 grand each on those red zeros have been shoved in the cupboard down at the Ministry of Transport and locked away, and that it will be safety at reasonable cost. And could you... Um, could you See, uh, 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 and I'm thinking those zeros could be used by Wayne Brown, for example, to uh, and you know show us what he's achieved in the last year. Yes, well, that's that's one of the things that I think is important to focus on. I, I learned many years ago, and it, harsh lessons in politics, that the public don't vote for you because you're a nice person and they don't vote for you because you're friendly at their school uh, prize giving and give something to their kids. They vote for you because you are delivering outcomes for them that you promised you would do. And at the end of your time, they go, wow. And the problem we've got at Auckland Council is we, we promised a lot of things and yet runs on the board after half a term, because it's coming up to 18 months of the three-year term, runs of the board are pretty hard to spot. I mean, we were going to get rid of the orange road cones, and yet as far as I can see, the little buggers are actually breeding because they're just more and more of them every they're term. They're self-replicating, I think. They're like bacteria, aren't they? They're just – yeah. I mean, yeah. I went to Milford the other day, and I turned the corner – uh, onto Hurstmere Road heading towards Milford. And I could not see the road for the amount of orange that was yeah. placed on it. I know. You know, it was incredible. There was, I think there was like 5,000 uh, road cones there and more were appearing as I drove past. I, I just wished I'd spotted it because if you'd started a, a road cone manufacturing business, uh, about five, six years ago before the government put all of its rules that you've, even if you are fixing a water leak somewhere down a road, what used to be the guy went down there with his spanner, lifted up the manhole, 
grabbed the pipe, pulled it together, tightened up the bolts, and that was it. Now you have to put a traffic safety management regime in place up every side road, up all roads leading to it. You have to have traffic calmed down to either stopped or through 30K. And that that is just insanity compared to where we were. Now, the argument was every now and then somebody got hurt at a building site because there wasn't proper tra- traffic safety management. But if you look at that Williamson Avenue uh, pedestrian crossing that costs sort of, you know, four ninety five hundred thousand, a hundred and seventy thousand of the cost of doing that pedestrian crossing, a hundred and seventy thousand was traffic safety management. That is getting all the orange cones, putting them all out, paying for whatever. I, I guess they lease them by the day or whatever, and and paying for all of that while you're putting down a pedestrian crossing. In the old days, you might have put one sign up either way, uh, beware pedestrian crossing being painted or sl- and cars slowed down and uh, took accordingly. And we've just got silly about it. Safety at reasonable cost can be the only way forward. The, there'll always be a death associated with it. In fact, I, I did a speech at high school and I won the speech contest with it. We had to I, give. I didn't know you went to high school, Morris. I didn't go for long. <laughs> you <laughs> went to my, eat your lunch, didn't you? I went, went to eat my lunch, but I, uh, yeah, they couldn't put me in the fourth form because my father was still in there. But uh, but the uh, the old joke that was we had to give speech on New Zealand's most dangerous sport, and all these other kids talked about rugby with the neck breaking and so on, or motor racing and people being killed in it, or skydiving and all these sports. And I gave a speech which won the speech contest, hilarious speech about uh, the most dangerous sport in New Zealand was lawn bowls. Without, <laughs> yeah. and that's because more people died every weekend playing lawn bowls than yeah. any other sport in New Zealand by a long way. Now you know why they died, of course, but, <laughs> but they died. And the facts and the, the facts I could present you with all the tabular. I data. imagine croquet is up there too. Croquet would be second or third down. Yeah, yeah. Mm. I think the word croquet is not a good word. <laughs> yeah, croquet. croquet. But, <laughs> but but lawn bowls was definitely the most dangerous sport. And if you looked at those numbers without knowing what it was and looked at how many people are dying, you'd be saying, right, we've got to ban this. I imagine have- indoor bowls is probably just as bad, just go as dangerous. Out, go out, close all the lawn bowl companies down, shut them all down because look at how many people are dying every week. Road to zero. We don't want any lawn bowls deaths. And that's your problem with the road to zero. It's a lovely idea. I wish no one died. Well, the only way you can have that is we have no activity on the roading network at all, uh, in which case you will actually have no one die, but would be bankrupt by by Friday. I see on Tuesday morning uh, there's an article in the Herald talking about AT and how in Point Chev they're building yes. some phenomenal number of these raised platforms. Uh I'm just going to try and find it uh, now. It's I think it's 26. Yeah, I, I saw think. the email come in before. It's a, it's a large number. I, I don't remember. But all yeah. I can say is that th- th- this just got to stop. This, this is just ridiculous. And what I loved about AT is the number of projects where they've gone in. We had one here at, uh, near our, our primary school where they went in and built this massive big roundabout and put all sorts. You couldn't actually come through uh, the, the streets affected. They were so badly blocked, locked with lumps and bumps. And then they tore it all out again. And there's been many examples of they've put it in and then they've pulled it all out again. And that's one of my angers about money spend. If you're spending somebody else's money, you don't really care. And I want to start caring about, we are custodian of the ratepayers' money. The poor buggers have had rate increase on rate increase to a point that it's just obscene. But I don't think they've seen the great service delivery. And our parks are not getting mowed any more than they used to. In fact, less. The berms don't get mowed. We're taking away rubbish bins from the parks and so on now, so you can just leave all your rubbish and pollute the waterways and so on. I think there's a strong view out there. Sadly, I have to say, and I've been a councillor now for eight, coming up to the 18-month period and it's halfway through, I don't believe we've yet made the big, hard decisions about staff rationalisation, about cost reductions and about service delivery uh, that you can benchmark against some of the most effective and efficient delivery mechanisms out there. I still think we're a bit of a lumbering organisation. So 
Runs on the board, pretty scarce at this point. Happy to admit that. You mentioned earlier in the in our conversation about the government being a lender of last resort. And I know Wayne Brown uh, last week was screaming uh, quite loudly that the government had taken away the Auckland excise tax, the extra tax that Auckland has paid on their fuel uh, because the Labor government decided that we should pay more tax on our fuel to fund a rail line to the airport that has not had a single millimetre built. And we've paid pretty much six years of this um, massive tax. And Wayne Brown's now crying about it because the money's been taken away and there's all these projects that AT was going to have funded by those taxes. And it seems, it, it, and he even made a, a bizarre statement saying to the government ministers, this is my city, not yours. Yet he's got his hand out for other people's money. And, yeah, and it, that, it, that, it that kind of doesn't make sense to me that you, you're saying it's my city, but you, everyone else in New Zealand, you all have to pay for what's in my city. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a dilemma that will always exist while we've got uh, local roads and government roads, all the state highway networks. So in Auckland here, SH1, SH16, SH18, SH20, they're all owned, operated and built by central government. Hmm. And they sit in amongst the network of all of the local roads. Now, I did propose, I put a document out in 1998 called Better Transport, Better Roads, in which we actually emerged and formed some roading companies that would own the entire roading network on a business-like basis, would have a proper balance sheet, would fund depreciation, and would actually manage those roads. It, it didn't succeed because it got so much opposition from every one of the councils in New Zealand that would see they had no reason for being anymore. So that didn't happen. But, but there is that issue that Mayor Brown says quite regularly on the radio, I want to put a congestion charge on the the main southern motorway at Green Lane and at Penrose and, and so on. I want to do it on SH16 coming in from the Waitakere's and I want to do it on the north northern motorway, um, you know, up to sort of Greenhithe or wherever. And you go, well, I'm just going to be a bit careful of that, Mr Mayor. I've said to him, we don't actually build, own, operate those roads. They are government's roads. The government owns them. It pays for them through your taxes. Uh, and um, you can't, under the current legislation, you can't have a third party charging you for access to something you don't own. It would be like you paying rent to somebody for a property they didn't own. You know, well, we're going to charge you rent for that house down the road. And you say, well, you don't actually own that house. So, I, I, I'm look, I'm delighted the government got rid of the regional fuel tax. I know that's not a widely held view among some of my council colleagues. And what I'm more delighted about anything is to see a government promise to do something in the campaign. If you vote for us, we will do this. And Auckland's vote is really worth doing some analysis on. I've got the breakdown of the party vote for what is called Auckland, and that is the 23 electorates, 22 mm -hmm. general and one Maori, that is Auckland Council. And then I've got the breakdown of the what's not Auckland. And listen to this. National got a 38% party vote across yep. the country. It got 45% party vote in Auckland and 35 non-Auckland. So a huge percentage difference, that's 10 percentage points, is massive. It yeah. is massive. So the people of Auckland voted, we like this policy, we like what you're saying, we are voting for you. And they even voted Michael Wood out of his electorate in Roscoe. Yeah. And, 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 wrote to zero. and other Labour members got voted out. So imagine what the media would have done to the new national government and Simeon Brown in particular if he said, ah, no, we're not going to do that. You can keep your regional fuel tax. They would have torn them to shreds for being liars and cheats. You promised you'd do it and so on. But when they did do it, and a refreshing change to see a government actually do what it said it would and promise the voters it would, how, how refreshing is that? It's a yeah. dangerous precedent. I hope it doesn't catch on. Yeah, but they said we would do it. They did it. The next thing they get bombarded, you know, you can't do this. Uh, well, yes, and in fact, the Auckland Council should have planned for this well in advance of the announcement last week. 
because it was always coming. I mean, the polls showed there was going to be a change of government well through all of last year. I mean, that's why Jacinda, mm. Jacinda bailed in February, not because there was nothing left in the tank. It was there's nothing left in the polls. Yeah. And so we knew there would be a change of government, whether it be a national government or a national act government or a national act in New Zealand, first, whatever it was going to be. It was be. going to be a change. So any council putting its budget together last year with political eyes on it, and I argued at the time, you're going to have to know that these guys, if they get elected, will stick to their promise. They promised to get rid of the regional fuel tax. Uh, TVNZ must have hated it, but they went out and did a vox pop of people at the petrol station the night it was all announced. They couldn't find one person that was opposed. They said, oh, this is great, love this. And I kept thinking, they must be trying to find someone for an hour. They, well, you, you must hate it. No, it's good. Okay, well, what about you? You don't like it. So they ended up with five or six or seven people, and everyone said, oh, I'm pleased. That's a great idea. Good news. So we have to cut our cloth accordingly. And what I think we as a council have to say is, right, it's clear we don't get that money anymore. We've got to cl- cut our spending cloth accordingly. And if and that means cancelling those projects at ATs, you know, well acknowledged a guilt edged. In fact, they're probably hammering the gold on to each of those things that they're doing on a daily basis. Um, and let, they have stop, to go. And let's stop building cycleways that are not used. This idea of oh, if you build it, they will come. I'm sorry, there's good examples where it has already been built and they don't come. If you come down to that gold plated cycleway around the Lagoon Drive and onto the Pakaranga Road that I was talking about earlier. I've sat down there with my camera sitting on a tripod for an hour and 38 minutes, I think it was, having my lunch and just listening to some news through headphones. And my camera's running constantly uh, and not one cycle come, a sunny day, lovely day, uh, not one cyclist came along during the entire time I'm sitting there. And yet I then spun my camera 90 degree around onto the Pakaranga Highway and there's just cars locked, blocked, stopped and backed up as far as your eye can see. And that's because the sort of the, the lunatics are running the asylum. The the people who believe cycling is the way to solve it. We need cycling and walking, and we don't want these evil thing called cars. I'm sorry, the priority has to be for a place like my ward, where 92.8 percent of people in the last census say that they use the motor vehicle as their main form of transport. We've got to start putting the focus on to how do we get that flowing more rapidly? How do we remove the barriers, not how do we build? Mm. There was a proposal under the previous government to put a speed bump on the Pakaranga Highway. This is three lanes in either direction. That is a major artery to get people into and out of the city every morning and every night. And then we're going to stick these big speed bumps on the Pakaranga Highway. Unfortunately, the local MP, who now, fortunately, is the Minister of Transport, said, you know, no way and held public meetings and, you know, the poor old AT people that attended them got sort of savaged by the public saying, what what is it that you guys are smoking? Because this is nuts. And uh, it, it got canned in the end. So I'm hopeful that with the new government policy statement to come out and a whole lot of the emphasis moved on to getting people moving around the city quicker, uh, getting better, faster, cheaper vehicle uh, passageways, uh, getting rid of the nonsense of road to zero, getting rid of the nonsense of building speed bumps on things like Pakaranga Highway. Well, cycleways where there's ne- they're never going to be used. So I was in Manukau the other day in Cavendish Drive in the oh, right. d- deep industrial air part of it, you know, like south of Manukau City Centre. Yeah. There's this cycleway they've put in that's about three feet wide and it's got a concrete edge, you know, all these sort of raised things that are concrete like booms uh, to protect the cycleways that's filled with detritus and rubbish and everything yep. else because it can't be swept. There's yep. never been a single cyclist I've ever seen on, and I'm there every week um, going down that road. It it would have co- it would have cost easily two million dollars to do what they've done for no benefit. It's it's an, actually an inconvenience for everybody else. Correct. But but it's also a little bit like, I know what's best for you, you don't. Yeah. And so I've decided that instead of you using a motor vehicle to get to wherever you work. You'll or, use a bicycle. I will make you use what they call as the sort of mode of transport that's, go, you know, the high intensity activity and so on. Well, uh, as I said, in the Pakaranga ward, and remember the ward that I represent, just this one ward called Howick Ward, 
we are bigger than any other city in New Zealand, just my ward, than other than Wellington or Christchurch. So we've got 157 or 158,000 people. It's a huge, it's bigger than Hamilton. It's bigger than, mm. it's bigger than Tower and so on. And 92.8% say in the census that they need the motor vehicle. And yet what is all of the focus gone on? It's how do we block off lanes? How do we stop you traveling? How do we actually reduce the, the arteries that you could move in in order to put big gold plated projects like cycleways which you even if you were a keen cyclist you couldn't cycle from where i live into the city every day you'd take hours to get in there and hours to get back so when i hear the new chairman of at saying he's a big fan of cycling and he made big store of the fact when he spoke to our council that he's a mammal i didn't know what that was i have to admit and i looked it up it's a middle-aged men in lycra and he's he's why proud. was he hired then? He should have been told to sling his hook. We should have got yeah. a taxi driver to to be yeah. the chief yeah. executive of AT. He's proud of this is the new chairman. He's proud of being a mammal, uh, and he lives in Parnell. And I thought, actually, you know, if I lived in Parnell, I could probably cycle into the city. It's all downhill, isn't it? You just drop downhill onto the flat, go along uh, Tamaki Drive, and turn into Commerce Street or whatever, and you're there. But that's not Auckland. Auckland starts at the Bombay Hills in the south, goes up to Walkworth in the north, and people work everywhere and they live everywhere else. We had a particular guy who had a company uh, in Glenfield when I was a member of parliament here. He lived up on Music Point on the tip of that peninsula at Bucklands Beach, but his company was based in Glenfield. And every day he had to work his way down the back path. Buckland's mm. Road and then across the Pakaranga Highway and then on the State Highway 1 and try to get across the Harbour Bridge and so on. And th th if you were in North Korea, you would just say, well, we're moving you. Your house is sold today and we're going to put you in the house next to where you It's not your house anyway. We're going to move you to a new government yeah, house in Glenfield. He, he then stops being the chief executive of that job a year later and he moves somewhere else. Well, we'll move. But you can't do that. We live in a country where we're free to live where you want and so on. So I'm, I'm really hopeful at this point. I've heard nothing but good signs come out of the new government about what they're going to do with uh, road user charging for vehicles, what they are going to do with um, things like getting rid of the ridiculous road to zero stuff and so on, and start having safety at reasonable cost. We want to see the road toll come down, but it has to be not at the expense of the total economic operation of the country. Just a final point, um, harking back to AT again, I see on Monday they shut down the rail network because apparently it was too hot in Auckland and the uh, the tracks could buckle on the on the rail network. And they didn't think that we could actually look up what the temperature was in Auckland for the previous five days when four of those five days were higher temperatures than what Monday was. And they didn't shut the network down on those four days. Yeah. So what's going on at AT? And um, February? Who would have thought it would be hot in February? <laughs> so are we what I've heard, and I, I can't verify this, so they might have a bit of pushback. But I was told last night by somebody who I think knows pretty much what the Kiwi Rail briefing said. It was some tracks south of Otahu on the Southern Line for the next four stations that they were concerned about the condition of the of the curves and the train being able to cave because of the expansion. But AT didn't say, okay, well, we'll stop the trains at Odahu and we'll bus you for the last four. Bu bus the five people that are on the train. What, what, oh, I don't know what it was five, but. Well, yeah. I was talking about the conductor and the driver and like, the oh, driver's include, assistant include, as well. Include those, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. But there was evidently, they shut it down all around the place. It was, you know, lines on all over the place got closed and it was chaos and so on. And I kept thinking, well, actually, that's not Kiwi Rail's fault. AT overreacted. Now, AT might come back and say, not true. We only did it on that little bit of line on the south where there was a problem. But I think not. And I think AT carry a bit of a can for the overreaction. They cancelled trains left, right and centre. And Kiwi Rail were only saying it was that southern t line south of Odo. You could even still go to Odo from the city, no problem. But trains should stop there for today. But, I mean, you know, who, who knew that it got hot in February?
Well, it wasn't even that hot. It was hotter <laughs> the week before. But, you know, this is a problem with public transport. It seems that public transport picks you up from somewhere you're not at. Yep. Right? And takes you somewhere that you don't want to go to. Yeah. Well, let, let me tell you, the co- I cop a lot of flack. While I was transport minister, I copped it, and I still cop it at the council. Uh, you just hate public transport. And I don't. And I'll tell you why I can prove that. I worked for British Airways in London, and the entire time I was working for British Airways, I never owned a car because I didn't need a car. Mm. I could go from anywhere to anywhere, either in the the underground, which was the most used for me, or I could use one of the red bus networks, the big double deck, or, or I could even use a black taxi if it was needed. And the cost of owning and running and storing a car was prohibitive. But here, where I live in Pakaranga, even when they build this eastern busway, which, remember, just crosses the Pamua Bridge and then dives south, won't come out to where all the population is. It doesn't come out to Bucklands Beach and Howick and Cockle Bay and Mallins Bay. It doesn't come out to where the population is. It dives south the moment it's crossed over and heads down through Botany going out down towards Flatbush. And so... How do you get to use that if you want to when you live where the vast bulk of the population out here lives? Oh, I know. You drive your car to a park and ride. Well, that may be, but there's But they'll no... only build one level of the park and ride. It'll be full instantly. No, oh, no, no, no. There is no plan on the Eastern Busway because I asked them yesterday. I met with the Eastern Busway people yesterday, and I said, is there any plan for even any one maybe park and rides? And they said, no, unlike the Northern Busway where there are park and rides, and they said the problem is that once we built them, they were full within minutes, and, you you know, they're, they're packed. So... Build you them bigger. Use public transport. How about we make it convenient? If I, I actually started because the motorway got so chocker at the hours I was trying to get in and out of town. I decided I would park around Glen Innes and jump on the train. And for my first three or four weeks at council, it worked brilliantly. I could be in downtown in sort of 10, 15 minutes, go to the council meeting, jump on the train, get back. But guess what happened? It was only, well, I don't know, three or four weeks or five weeks into me being a councillor that AT announced that the Eastern Line was stopping for a year, for a year, not not for the afternoon, not for that week, but for a year. It's only just started up again in January. So what do you think people do? They go to alternatives and you've got... And um, they don't go back. They don't go back. There's I mean, no that's way. the thing. If you have to... I mean, I lived in Whangaparoa for a number of years, you know, seven years or so, and they had park and rides that were always full. Yes. So... so if you have to drive your car to get on a bus, you'll just carry why on. You just carry on and skip the bus part. You'll just carry on, and that's yeah. the. So, so I'm not anti-public transport. I I love the fact that public transport works, and I've got a great quote for you. I was giving a speech about the balance between public transport and roading networks, and and how we get the state highways to all connect up so that traffic can flow. Uh, back in the 90s, and a lady jumped up and she was real greeny and she was angry at what I was saying. And she said, I'm telling you, I've just been in Hong Kong and they've got the most fabulous underground rail system and that's what we need. Now, remember, at this stage, Auckland was less than a million and New, and New Zealand was less than four. Mm. I said to her, ma'am, I've got you a deal. I'm Minister of Transport. I've got the power. I'll do you a deal here and right here tonight. You give me... 7 million people between Parnell and Ponsonby, which is what Hong Kong mm. is, Yeah, and I'll give you a fabulous underground rail network. But we've got less than the population of Sydney in our entire country. We've got less than the population of Melbourne in our entire country. And so these grandiose views of the world, you know, oh, I've been to London, look at their underground rail. Jesus, well, I don't know what greater London is, but it's 15 or 17 million people. So let's stop being silly about it. Let's mm. do the things that work. Let's make sure the benefit-cost ratios are really clearly identified. Let's not build the gold-plated cycleways because we are building cycleways that could be built for a tenth of that much in terms of how what we build and all these bloody road uh, blocks along the side of them to, as you said, out in, in uh, Cavendish, just just a, sh- a sort of eyesore. If common sense prevails... And I'm very hopeful that with what the new minister said is about his priorities and what the mm. government was, then we'll actually return to 
let's start focusing on the biggest users of our roading network, and that's motorists. And by the way, what contribution do cyclists pay towards their roads? None. 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 And People accuse me of being a, a, a hostile to public transport. I'm a big fan of tr- public transport. I'm seen on the back of a bus <laughs> constantly with the RCR advertising, and that's the closest you're going to get to me to public transport. No, well, I'm different. I, I loved it. In London, I loved it. I thought it was just fabulous, and I could get to Twickenham by the, the underground, and I could go to down to uh, to watch Wimbledon yeah. tennis. It was, and it was, and it was rapid. Yeah, you, it, you, but it worked. I never looked at the timetable. I would just whip down the stairs at my local station, stand on the platform, and I knew within three to four minutes another train came through, jump on, use the green line, go to the circle line, catch the Piccadilly yeah. line, bang, you're there. And what made it even better in recent years is I tried to buy an Oyster card, and the guy behind the counter at, at the station I was at, he said, what do you want an Oyster card for? I said, so I can use the train for a week because it's cheaper if you buy the car. He said, you don't need to. I said, well, he said, just use your credit card. And I said, well, how do I do that? He said, you just swipe it across the terminal like you used to do the Oyster. So I thought, oh, yeah, I bet my ASB card from New Zealand will work. Walked up to the turnstile, swiped, and it did. Got on the bloody train, got off at the other end, swiped off, and I looked at my ASB account the next day, and there was a 38 pence charge for the use of the train. So. Yeah. That's what changes it, the convenience, the speed, and it comes when you need it and you don't have to worry about parking. And you need a population base to support it. The population base gradually grows and starts to make it work. And so it's like London- you ask cycle um, act, act, you know, activists, you say to them, well, give us some examples where cycleways work. And they always, always, without fail, say Amsterdam. Yeah. Oh, yeah? yeah. So what, how are you going to get rid of all of the hills in Auckland then to make it like Amsterdam? Yeah, but, but all sorts of other things. The, the, the history of how a country grew up and what it, I mean, they've got lots more intense living in apartments than we've ever mm. had. We, we had the quarter acre section for so long, and it's going to take a long time. You you literally can't compare apples and oranges in this stuff. We've got a specific set of topography with hills and, and some difficult stuff. Wellington's even worse in terms of how, how the hell cycleways will work around Wellington. You finish work and you've got to face the daunting charge of about an hour of going uphill into crippling. Blood. So, look, common sense should prevail. Realistic benefit cost ratios should be taken into account. And this idea of some, I will decide on behalf of you what's best for you rather than you make that mm. determination. And on that note, Morris, I think we've run out of time. Good to be with you, mate. Pleasure to have you back on the crunch, and we'll have to make this a regular occurrence. Sounds good to me. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. Bye bye. Bye. Morris is a fantastic font of knowledge, especially about transport. Auckland Council really needs to get on and start doing the things that they're elected to do. Perhaps Wayne Brown might like to listen more and speak less. Let me know your thoughts on this topic, good or bad, by emailing inbox at realitycheck.radio or text to 2057. Thank you for tuning in to RCR Reality Check Radio. If you like what you're listening to, just like what you're listening to. Either way, we want to hear from you. Get in touch with us now. You can text us with your message to 2057. That's 2057. Or email us at inbox at realitycheck.radio. We would love to hear from you. So connect with us today.